<laughs> See how it works? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to take the shorter mic. So, once again, welcome. How many of you came from the life class? How many are here that came, heard about it and came from the life class? Oh, just one of you. So I'm wondering where you all heard about this. We have such a great, wonderful crowd, and I'm just so thrilled. Huh? The flyer. The flyer. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you to my students who put up flyers. And so we're very excited that you're here. So first of all, my name is Sherry Allen. This class is called The Impact of Radio on Our Lives. It was created in about 2008, I think, by a man named Leon Levy, who was the uh, non-credit coordinator. And... Um, our dean at the time was Linda Lee, and so they, they got this course going, and uh, but they were too busy to actually teach the course, so they gave it over to me. Now, I didn't actually grow up during the golden age of radio, but I have learned so much about it from all of my wonderful students, some of whom are in the audience here today. So uh, it's very exciting that you're here. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started, uh, which is to say that the restrooms and the drinking fountain are out here, uh, out this door. If you come and go during the performance, please do so quietly because these doors make a lot of noise. So just make sure you, if you need to go out, just make sure you quietly open and close the door. Next, here's where you quietly turn off your cell phones. <laughs> yes, because we have live sound effects during this performance, just like they would have in the golden age of radio. So if your phone starts beeping or making any other weird sounds, people might think it's actually part of the show. <laughs> so make sure you mute those or turn them off right now. Um, also, following the performance, we have a lovely buffet of hors d'oeuvres, which were provided by our students. So let's give them a wonderful applause for doing that. Um, and finally, on the back of your program, if you would like to join this class and become a part of the fun, uh, the enrollment information is on the back of your program, along with another class that we have here called... Um, what do we call it? We call it Awareness Through Improvisation. It's our improv acting class, and it's loads of fun. We have a summer session of improv, which will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, this summer, right here, um, from 1.30 to 4 p.m., and so please register today at the front desk. That would be wonderful. Uh, the radio class is not offered again until the fall semester, and that happens on Mondays right here at the CLC also at 1.30. Uh, in the fall, we also have another section of improv. In addition to our Wednesday class in the fall, we have a Tuesday class at the Encinitas Library. So if that, if the, not the one on uh, Cornish, not on Duff, the one on Cornish. So if you uh, live in the Encinitas area, that would be a great time to come uh, to the improv class. Now, one more shameless bit of self-promotion on my part. I'm in a play, guys. If you want to come see my play, if you like a little kid, come see my recital. Uh, it's Picnic at Oceanside Theater Company. Uh, it's just on the corner of Mission and, and the 101, very nearby. It runs through the 21st, um, and it is a play from the 1950s by William Inge. It's about a lot of women, so that's neat to see a play that features a lot of strong women. Um, and it's got uh, another, not only myself, but the drama chair from Miracosta, um, Tracy Williams. Yeah, Tracy Williams. And so, uh, you know, come check out a great play. It runs Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays through the 21st. And it's good. Oh, it's not always one of my students. You're just saying that. You get an A. You get an A. No, she's, she's not just saying it. Not just, oh. Friday night, it's fabulous. Oh, my goodness, thank you. Sherry is fabulous. That's Malka, That's another, another Sherry, former student of mine. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Guys. Stop it, you guys. Stop. No, please. Okay. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to, uh, we have a master of ceremonies, which is Ruth Ann Duncan, an announcer, which is Dwight Smart. Our music is by Anita Allen, no relation, I'm lying, she's my mom. And, uh, and uh, the slideshow was created by Chuck Knox, and we've got so many fun scripts for you today, not only Burns and Allen, my friend Erman, Irma, Taran, an original script written by Jordan Lawson, one of our students here. Yeah! Yeah! 
and uh, uh, so and and more. So we have a lot of fun things for you here today. Thank you all for coming. And now I'm going to pass it on to Jordan, who's going to give a brief intro, and then uh, Ruth Ann will take it from there. Thank you all again. For Did Lola make it? Yeah, she's in the back. She's right back there. there Lola. Oh, there she is. My God. <laughs> Good to see you, Lola. I'd like to introduce Lola. She's a columnist and feature writer for the San Diego Union Tribune. <laughs> Lola has been gracious enough to write nice articles about this and our improv class. We, we welcome you, Lola. Thank you. Uh, Diana Makett, Diana Atkins, former teacher. Okay, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank Oric Smith. Oric? Oric's invaluable electronic knowledge has helped us over and over in our radio productions over these past years, and we again thank him for his efforts. Thank you, Oric. Special this year, we want to thank Chuck Knox, Chuck for his experience, expertise in converting pictures into the graphics you'll see behind us. He also supplied the material for my lobby display that I did with my bare hands. <laughs> Finally, uh, Sherry Allen, our STEAM teacher. Sherry encouraged me to resurrect my old screenplay written 35 years ago. I was a mere child. Of course. <laughs> she has allowed me to write, produce, co-direct, cast the actors, and narrate Kronterren. Other than that, I really had nothing to do. <laughs> and now, I want to introduce our MC, Ruth Ann, who has a few words for you. Good afternoon. Welcome to another installment of the impact of radio drama on our lives. Today we will be looking back at radio programs that say a lot about our shared humanity. What makes us laugh or cry, who we are as Americans, the 20th century history that shaped us, and the evolution of comedy and drama in a changing world. But just wait a minute. Before we turn on the radio, Let's hear from another huge influence of our lives, also sound bites from the past, the voices of the folks who raised us. Most of our generation was taught by our parents in many ways. The younger generation may not believe it, but we were told these exact words by our parents. My mother taught me about medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're going to stay that way. <laughs> My mother taught me about contortionism. Look at that dirt on the back of your neck. <laughs> My mother taught me about foresight. Always wear clean underwear. <laughs> In case you're in an accident. My mother taught me logic. If you fall out of that swing and break your neck, I'm not taking you to the store with me. <laughs> <laughs> My mother taught me about science and osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your stepper. <laughs> <laughs> My mother taught me about stamina. You sit there until all that spinach is gone. <laughs> My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. If you're going to kill each other, <laughs> My mother taught me religion. You better pray that will come out of the carpet. <laughs> my father taught me about my roots. Shut up the door. You weren't born in a barn. <laughs> my father taught me about logic. Because I said so, that's what <laughs> My father taught me about genetics. You're just like your mother. <laughs> then my father taught me about behavior modification. 
I said, stop acting like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, my father taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids and I hope they turn out just, just like you. you. <laughs> Anything sound familiar? <laughs> Our first piece is a series of scripts from Burns and Allen, a pair whose performances span decades of the 20th century. In fact, as early as 1910, Gracie Allen was tap dancing on the stage at her parochial school in San Francisco. She quickly graduated to vaudeville, where she met and married George Burns, the love of her life. He was a straight man on the stage, and she was his lovable dingbat. <laughs> straight man and foil were to be the personas that moved Burns and Allen forward from vaudeville into those really funky early movies through their long run on radio and finally TV. For decades, Gracie's illogical logic captivated American audiences. And of course, running gags were a staple of the Burns and Allen routine. Today we will listen in on some, and Dwight will tell you more about it. In 1940, Gracie, in perhaps the biggest publicity stunt in American history, declared herself as a candidate for the President of the United States. Gracie and George did a cross-country whistle trot campaign on a private train. Somewhat miraculously, Harvard University endorsed Gracie. <laughs> Let's listen in on a press conference in which Ditsy Gracie Allen fields questions from a news reporter as George Burns playfully taunts her, taunts her away. Miss Allen, I'm a reporter for the Daily News, and my readers want to know what your platform is. Well, it's Naughty Pine. Trimmed with oak and inlaid with California redwood. <laughs> Is that to match your head? I thought so. <laughs> Miss Allen, what would be the first thing you would do if you were elected? I'd put my daddy in the Senate. Your dad, daddy doesn't know anything about the Senate. Oh, yeah? He's been making speeches from the floor for years. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Allen, my senior editor wants to know if you are in favor of monopolies. Oh, I don't play monopoly. <laughs> That's because I like Mahjong better. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Allen, what do you think of the neutrality bill? Well, if we owe it, let's pay it. <laughs> There's no use in trying to interview Gracie. Why did you just call us off? You haven't said one thing that's right. Well, I'd rather be president than right. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Allen, all the other candidates are talking about how to bring back prosperity. What is your point of view? She doesn't know any what prosperity is. I do, too. Prosperity is when business is good enough so you can buy the things on credit that you can't afford anyway. And that way you can save enough money to pay cash for new things after they have taken back the things you bought on credit. Miss <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ellen, could you officially recognize Russia? It's hard to say. You see, I meet so many people. <laughs> what do you think of the British blockade of the Black Sea? Oh, we'll just drive around it. <laughs> Miss Allen, what do you think of our national debt? We ought to be proud of it. It's the biggest in the world. <laughs> now, Miss Allen, how would you keep our gold reserves from shrinking? Well, I'd wash it in lots. <laughs> it gets everything cleaner than anything else. <laughs> Miss Allen, is there anything you can actually promise our voters? Oh, sure. I can promise voters that if I can't find a way to reduce the high cost of living, we'll just have to do without it. <laughs> the surprise party mascot. 
wait till you see the picture I had taken. Gracie, I'm not interested in any picture. We're here to do a broadcast. You know, um, the Democrats have a donkey and the Republicans have an elephant. And yeah, what do you have, Gracie? A school? Oh, I wish I had thought of that. I posed with a kangaroo. A kangaroo? It will make a wonderful campaign mm, picture. I'll bet it will. The little baby kangaroo is peeking his head out of the mama kangaroo's pouch. Hold on, Gracie. A baby kangaroo sticking his head out of the pouch? Yes, and it's going to be my election slogan. What slogan? <laughs> it's in the bag. <laughs> My, the paper is full of news this morning. I hardly know which item to explain to the readers of my column. Wait a minute, Gracie. You explain the news to them? Oh, yes. Everyone doesn't have my uncanny grasp of world affairs. I'm not the average person, George. Uh, that I've known for years. <laughs> Some people have the minds of children and it's my duty to guide them. I see. What would you like to know, dear? Not a thing, Gracie, nothing at all. Now, you take the elections last Tuesday. Do you realize how confused those poor Republicans who got elected must be? I'll bet some of them wind up in Seattle or Tacoma. Seattle? Tacoma? Yes. They've been out of office so long, they won't know which Washington to go to. <laughs> <laughs> Qualities of a good president. Gracie, do you have any idea what a person has to be before they become president? Sure. Elected. Don't make us absurd. Oh, stop worrying, George. I may not even be elected until next November. Well, that's a load off my mind. I might not even be in the White House before 1941. I see. So in other words, you're as good as in. You, the President of the United States. And Mexico. And Mexico? <laughs> oh, sure. It's just across the border from California. So it'll be easy for them to vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> What about Canada? It'll be a landslide. This may be a shock to you, but there are some places that don't belong to the United States. For a president that takes a person of tremendous stamina, a person with unusual ability and sound judgment, a mental genius. Oh, thanks. Thanks? A president has to have courage and show plenty of backbone. If you want to see backbone, just wait until you see my new evening dress. <laughs> The president has to have plenty of votes. Votes? Well, wait until you see my new evening dress. <laughs> Quiet. A president must have determination. He must let people see what he's made of. If you want to see what I'm made of... Wait till you see her new evening dress. <laughs> Democrat. My mother's a Republican. 
And when I was born, I was a surprise. <laughs> Society, the Irish Mrs. O'Reilly, the Russian Professor Kropotkin, and the deadbeat boyfriend Al. All characters peopling a tenement house of a great American city. Sexist remarks are in full bloom, way before the notion of political correctness. And those horrible <coughs> commercials dealing with indelicate topics we would all like to shh, yeah. listen up and see if you agree with me afterwards. Was it a different world or not? You decide. And now from Hollywood, my friend Irma. My name is Jane. I have a roommate named Irma. Just the other day, she was saying to me, I'm taking a bubble bath. <sighs> Cookie, you've been in there all afternoon. Will you please hurry out? Mrs. O'Reilly expects us downstairs in an hour. Oh, but I bought two kinds of bubble bath, and I don't know which one is best. <laughs> How are you going to tell? I'm counting the bubbles. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I lost count. Now I have to start all over again. One, two, three, four. Irma, you do that. So help me, I will burn the house down. Come on. Oh, just five more minutes. The water feels so good. Jenny, what's water made of? <laughs> well, it's H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen? It, isn't that what they give you when you have trouble breathing? Yeah, that's I'm right. I'm so glad you told me. A friend of mine has asthma, and I'll send him a bottle of water. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you test it? Duck your head under the water and keep it there for five minutes. I can't. I just had my hair done. <laughs> Irma, get out of that tub and get dressed. I'm going to go straight in the living room. All right, I'll put on my robe. Close the door, Jane. It's chilly. Make it snappy. The tea Mrs. O'Reilly is giving is the biggest event of her life. Her brother just got back from Africa, and he's going to tell us all about it. Oh, oh, Jane. What? What's the matter? Come here. Come here. What's the matter? The friendship ring Al gave me, I left it on the sink and it slipped down the drain. Oh, Irma. <clears throat> I've heard of gold-plated rings, but brass-plated rings? <laughs> how am I going to... Honey, how am I going to get out this out of this narrow little pipe? We're on the third floor. I don't care what it's made of. I can't watch my love slip down the drain. Please, Jane, help me get it out. Don't we know anybody with a long, skinny hand? <laughs> okay. Gee, if somebody in this building uses the water, it's liable to wash my ring down the river. I hope it's not too late. I'll call Professor Kropotkin through the window. Oh, Professor Kropotkin, will you come down right away? Oh, yes, Irma, darling. Oh, Irma, 
stop making a fuss. You can easily get another ring from the bubble gum machine. <laughs> Come in, Professor. We're in the bathroom. What's the trouble, girls? You know that ring that Al gave Irma? It fell down the drain. Well, that can't do any harm. I think it belongs to the plumbing. I look more like a washer than a ring. I'm not going to have you talk that way. I'm sorry, Irma. Jane, have you got any bio? Yes, Professor. I think so, right in this closet. Does this look long enough? Oh, I hope no one is using the water. Who knows? I'll bend the vial with a little hook. There. Okay, let's go fishing. You think you'll get it out, Professor? Fit the plumbing in this building? Who knows what goes there? But we'll see. You've got over 20 feet of wire there. It should go past Mrs. O'Reilly's. Maybe near the basement. Do you feel anything yet? No. And that hook will grab anything in the bay. Come in. Oh, Janie, Janie. Mrs. O'Reilly, you're white as a sheep. What's wrong? Oh, Janie, I was in my bathroom washing the false eyelashes when a long black thing came out of the closet, <laughs> grabbed me eyelashes out of me hand, and it disappeared. Stick it out, Mrs. O'Reilly. I'm reeling it in. <laughs> We caught two octopuses. <laughs> Those are me eyelashes, and don't be funny. What's going on here anyway? I dropped the ring Al gave me down the drain, and I'm afraid someone will wa wash it down the river. Well, I'll send for the plumber, but you'll have to pay the bill. Will you shut the water off till he gets here? Shut the water off? Irma, I'm giving a tea in an hour, and I have to get myself all frittied up. A girl needs a drop or two of water. A drop or two? All the butter and water the Hoover Dam wouldn't help you. Look how many different shades of red you got in your hair. You paint that through a Venetian blind? Who's talking? <laughs> why, you skinny mongoose. I don't see why you have to use a wire to get down that pipe. If you pull your ears in, you could get through it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please don't argue, Mrs. O'Reilly. You know I never asked too much of you. But if you like me just a little bit, you will shut the water off. Well, this is a terrible time to ask me, but all right. I'll shut the water off for half an hour. Oh, thank you. But plumber or no plumber, it goes on in half an hour because I've got company coming, and you're only giving me 30 minutes to make myself attractive, and I don't think it's fair. Neither do I. How can she straighten up in 30 minutes when it took you 70 years to wrinkle up? This is Earl Eiley. I'll go down to the basement and shut off the water. Oh, fancy that. Every day, every so often, you say something gentlemanly. Uh-oh, do you want to come with me? Yes, there are no <laughs> lights down there. It's very, very dark. Oh, is it? Doesn't that give you any ideas? Yes, why don't you go to bed? You look now and just hold the party down there. <laughs> Jane, how long has the water been shut off? Oh, about ten minutes. Why? Plenty. When the water's around, you don't miss it, but when it's shut off... Jane, are you thirsty? No. I am. Oh, that's just your imagination. Forget about it. All right. Jane, how long can the human body go without water? Well, it all depends. You see, the human body is 90% water. It is? Mm-hmm. Wish there was some way I could squeeze myself. I'm so thirsty. <laughs> oh, Irma, will you stop that? You're just building things up because the water shut off. Ridiculous. Say, um, do we have any soda or coke here? <laughs> You're getting thirsty? Me? Oh, no. I don't think I'm 90% water. When I walk, I don't hear any splash. <laughs> oh, stop. Stop talking about it and let's turn on the radio and that'll take our minds off. All right. He lay in the sun, his throat parched. First thing he day, he came to Death Valley. Turn that radio off. All right, Jane, you don't have to yell. Now let's not have another word about water. Irma, will you finish getting dressed? I can't, Jane. I'm weak from thirst. Oh, honey, get your mind off it. Read a book. A book? Oh, here's one. 
the Desert Fox. <laughs> Not that one. Irma Peterson, if you hadn't dropped that darn ring down the drain, maybe that's the one. Come in. I'm sorry, girls, but I won't be able to get a plumber till tomorrow. Well, I, well, then I'm not going to the party. I won't leave here till I get my ring. Yeah, my darling, we called every plumber in the neighborhood. They're not easy to get. Do you know how much a plumber makes? For a small job, they don't even get off their yacht. <laughs> he told one plumber me head was caught in the washing machine. And he said, just make me comfortable and set it down for two rinses. I don't, I don't care. Al gave me that ring the first night we met. It's a symbol of our love. I know, honey. I'll never forget it. I had a job as a hostess in a dance hall. You know, 10 cents a dance. And Al was my first customer. I still have his IOU. <laughs> <laughs> and when we got home, Al gave me that ring. And now you expect me to be happy, right? While my love is on its way to the sore? Never! I gotta stop taking this girl to see Betty Davis. <laughs> it's doing things to her. Mrs. O'Reilly, you and the professor better get down to your apartment. I'll be there when your brother arrives. Come on, Mrs. O'Reilly. Are you going to serve refreshments? Why, yes, I made me famous cherry tarts. Oh, no. Your cherry tarts are lethal as African dots. <laughs> oh, I hope Mr. Clyde is home. <coughs> oh, Mr. Clyde, there's something I must ask you. Oh, no. You bothered me on my day off? Make it snappy. My wife and I are just sitting down for some cribbage. And if you tell me it goes well with corned beef, I'll kill you. <laughs> now, what's the problem? Well, six years ago, my boyfriend gave me a friendship ring, and I just dropped it down the sink. So, what about it? Do you know any plumbers? What? You see, that ring meant the world to me. Why? Is it gold? No. Platinum? No. Silver? No. Bronze? No. Copper? No. Will you give me a hint? Or do I have to go all the way down the paper? What it's made of doesn't matter. It dropped down the drain, and Mrs. O'Reilly wants to turn the water on. Isn't there some way we can stop her? No, Miss Peterson. We have only one legal step within our power. What's that? We can sue the drain pipe for alienation, alienation of affection. Mr. Clyde, please don't make jokes. Can we get a Corpus Christi or a red omnibus? You mean a writ of mandamus? I've been working in your law office six years, but I still can't remember those Spanish words. You're an authority. What can we get? My dear, I will tell you what we can get. We can get a bit of transportation. Oh, that's wonderful. What is it? As a legal document in which the men in white coats take you back to the institution from which you escaped. <laughs> now get out of here. Uh, <laughs> okay, Jane, I'm here. Oh, Al, I'm glad you got my message. Did you bring another ring for Irma? Uh, like sorry, Jane. Was. Couldn't pick it up. Couldn't pick up another. Oh, don't tell me they're expensive. No, it's not that. You see, it wasn't really a ring. It was a brass fitting from a milking machine, <laughs> and it just continued the model. <laughs> just great. Now what am I going to do? She won't go to Mrs. O'Reilly's party. You mean my chicken won't go anywhere while my ring is in the pipe? <laughs> Boy, what devotion. You know, you couldn't find a dog that loyal. I believe it. I think I'll take her next week for rabies shots. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine loving a guy like me. See, Jane, guess I got more than meets the eye. <laughs> yeah, in fact, some of it meets the nose. <laughs> what is that cologne you're wearing? You like it? it it's, it's French. Ow. 
bouillabaisse is made for eating, not for wearing. <laughs> Chicken, calm down. Oh, Al, will you stay here with me until I get the ring out? Can't, Chicken. My pal Mushy's been arrested for theft, and I have to be his witness. Mushy was arrested? Well, you know Mushy. They caught him walking out of a supermarket with a live chicken under his coat. He threw the bird away, but they're going to convict him on circumstantial evidence. <laughs> See, they found a hot egg in his pocket. So long, Chicken. <laughs> Irma, it's time to go to Mrs. O'Reilly's. You'll have fun. Forget all about the ring. Nothing doing. I'm going over to the library. Maybe they'll have a book on plumbing. Bye. Well, Mrs. O'Reilly, this is Frederick Brown. Is that Patrick, the explorer over there? Yes, doesn't he look wonderful? It's hard to believe he's 68. He's older than I am. That you better tell the telltale, not you. Who are all these people? I have friends. Mrs. O'Reilly. Oh, Janie, darling. Where's Irma? Oh, she's at the library trying to get a book on plumbing. Mrs. O'Reilly, you look wonderful. What a beautiful dress. Well, thank you. I had it made specially for this tea. I barely got it from the dressmaker in time. From behind, it looks she's, like she's still in it. Now, cut it out. This is called a bustle, and it's the newest thing. Mrs. O'Reilly, who are all these people? Who's that sporty-looking gentleman over there? That's McDonald. He's a baker. He invented a donut with a hole so large you can put two fingers through it to dunk and smoke a cigarette at the same time. <laughs> Who's that distinguished-looking gentleman? Oh, that's one of me beaux, Flanagan. He thinks I'm the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. You mean the thick one with the thick glasses who just walked into the wall? <laughs> Shut up. He tripped. Now I'll serve the tea, and then we'll listen to me brother's adventures in Africa. Can I help you, miss? Uh, have you got a book on plumbing? Mm, have you tried looking under P? I looked under B. I lost my ring in the bathroom. Oh. <laughs> Try looking under a P for plumbing. Oh, hello, Irma. Oh, Violet Murphy. Quiet, please. Oh, I forgot. Violet, what are you doing here? I read some evenings. I have to rest up for my new boyfriend. A new boyfriend? Yes, he's a frog salesman. And does he keep me jumpy? <laughs> Isn't that cute? I tell it to all my friends. People always joke about a man who sells frog legs. They do? My family didn't joke when I met him. What did they say? That we should both croak. <laughs> you know how critical parents are. Irma, what brings you here? I dropped the ring Al gave me down the drain, so I'm getting a book on plumbing. Oh, say, let's get together for dinner some night. Would you like frog legs? Yeah. Great. My boyfriend brings home the rejects. The restaurants won't take them if they're fractured. I have, to, I have to say goodbye now, Violet. Bye. Call me. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Um, plumber's manual. Oh, in old buildings, by tapping on a pipe, one may discover the location of an obstruction or object. It is important to tap gently, or a broken pipe may result. Now, where is my hammer? <laughs> I must have that ring. That was delicious, Mrs. O'Reilly. Well, thank you, Janie. Wait till you hear me, Brother Patrick. He's so exciting. You'll imagine you're in deepest Africa. All right, Patrick, we're ready. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, I've just returned from the land of the pygmies. 
Which reminds me, it's nice to see me sister again. Well, thank you, Patrick. Not at all, me dear. Say, where's Irma? She's working on an irrigation project. <laughs> and now we're ready for the lecture. Never in me life have I known such terror as stalked us in the jungle. And in the distance was the beating of tom-toms. Glory be, I can almost hear it now. And then would come out of nowhere a flash of lightning and a sudden downpour of rain. Water pouring through the ceiling. It must be our place upstairs. Mrs. O'Reilly, look, there's a brass ring on your nose. You're an African queen. <laughs> Verma and Jane will be back in a moment, but first, insist on Anne's chlorophyll tablet. Anne stock triple O in an amazing scientific odor study. Eight out of ten customers stop. The body odor, breath odor, and other odors with ends. Insist on ends chlorophyll tablets. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Only 49 cents. And now back to the program. Any of you folks need any plumbing done? Irma Peterson, because she's going to have to make some extra money to pay for the damages done. She's not worried a bit. She's just happy she got her ring back. It burns me up that it isn't even a real ring. I think I better tell her the truth. Irma? Yes, Jane? Honey, you might as well know the truth. That piece of junk Al gave you, it's not a real ring. It's just a brass fitting from a milking machine. <laughs> How can you say that? It's even engraved on the inside. Really? Oh, honey, I didn't know that. Read what it says. To set for three quarts, turn to the right. <gasps> oh, no! <laughs> there she goes again, crying. Between her tears, the leaking pipe, there's so much water in here, I'll be able to swim the English Channel. <laughs> That's if I go on living with my friend Irma. Let's have a round of applause, another round of applause. And so, we move to a serious piece, adapted from what was originally a screenplay. Union Radio Drama Class are proud to present an original script written by our own Jordan Lawson. The story grapples with the themes of good versus evil and is set in some far distant future. As for me, in more homely comparisons, I think of the Lone Ranger and his solo sidekick, Tonto. Their remote, dusty western landscapes on planet Earth evolve into far away, deep space settings on the edge of the universe. Their goal, however, spanning time and space, is the same, reading the territory of the bad guys. Welcome to Cronterra. We are transported to the year 2091 as the journey along with five graduating cadets from the United Planetary Space Academy and the crew of an intergalactic space cruiser, the Star Pilot, to an uncharted quadrant of the galaxy. The mission rescue the doomed survivors of the planet from Terran. Captain, this is Dr. Kamaroff in medical. How are the injured crewmen, Cap, Doctor? Healing, Captain. I recommend a full month's rest away from active duty. Agreed. We are on an intercepting course for planet Earth now. 
As the ship approaches Earth's orbit, the large video screen displays the image of the presider of the United Space Council with an important message. Captain McAndrew, this message is highly classified. Reroute your ship to the Space Academy and immediately pick up the five cadets to replace your injured crewmen while they recuperate on Earth. Stand by for further instructions. <coughs> hey, Matt, did you see that? A space cruiser just landed near the Academy. That ship has nothing to do with us. Come on, guys. We've got a class to get to. Oh, all right. I'll check it out later. Matt bursts into the sleeping quarters, shared by the five cadets. Hey, guys. I just found out we're going into space. All five of us? I can't believe it. After they install that new hyperdrive engine. If all goes well, you mean. What? That means we'll be in space in three days. The next day, Captain McAndrew calls a meeting of the entire Star Pilot crew. Crew, you are looking at the planet Grondarin. Navigator Quan Lee will fill you in. The planet has been knocked out of orbit and is plunging toward its sun. Thank you, Officer Lee. Our orders are to organize the evacuation of all remaining Grondarins before the planet burns up. Prepare for liftoff tomorrow at 0800 hours. We should arrive just in time to prevent disaster, Captain. In the morning, a loud roar was heard as the ship lifts off its moorings. <laughs> Months has passed since the ship roared away from Earth and glided into space. Navigator Quan Lee, Captain. The ship now approaches the coordinates where the planet is supposed to be. Captain, the planet is not near. It was knocked out of orbit. Checking long-range scanners. A red planet has been spotted. Security officer Kim Check, sir. A scan of the planet's surface detects a bright, distressed light coming from a large hole. Officer Kevinloff from medical, sir. Our sensors tell us oxygen levels are rapidly deteriorating. The surface temperature is rising above human endurance. The atmosphere seems to be exploding in fire. It's only a matter of time before the firestorm reaches that light. First Officer Sharp, take the shuttle down to assess the condition of the current errors. Take Navigated Lee, Security Team Kinchek and Gonzalez, Cadet Bantu, and Dr. Kavriloff to care for any injured. Aye, Captain. The shuttle craft leaves the ship. Navigator Lee, land on the surface, officer near the gigantic hole in the ground. Quan, stay clear of that light. It's pretty hot out there. I'll get the thermal suits out of the rocker. What the? Wait, don't shoot. It's me, Ariku. Ariku, how did you get on board? I was so excited when you found the Kronteran and that I wanted to help, I hid in the locker. Ah, my little Martian friend. It appears we have no choice but to keep you here. Cadet Arico, stay here. Officer Lee, notify the ship we are beginning our search. Dr. Kavrilov, Gonzalez, and I will leave the shuttle and head toward the hall with the distress light. A suggestion, Officer Sharp, as security on this mission, I'll go ahead to check out that light. It's, if it's safe, I'll sign, signal you forward. Affirmative. We'll wait for your signal. Be careful, my friend. Gonzalez here. I'm approaching the edge of the hole and looking in the wall is getting louder. Worker! Ah, my eyes! Ah! on the ground, holding his smoldering mask. The doctor and Alan rush to him and pull off his mask. 
there are two black holes where his eyes once were. Oh my God, his eyes have been burned out. Third degree burns. He needs immediate medical attention. We must get him back to the ship. Look, the Crontarans are emerging from the hole and are floating slowly upward. The air is filled with a loud noise and lightning flashes. The others stare in shock and disbelief. The Crontarans emit a loud moaning noise. Oh, Doctor, oh, I think their leader has made his entrance. The one wearing the long flowing robe standing by the hole. Moaning. <laughs> My God! A ten foot humanoid with a metallic face and glowing red eye plate. Look, he lowered his arm and the other Crontarans are descending to the ground. He's advancing toward us. I, I am First Officer Alan Sharp of the United Planetary Space Cruiser Star Pilot. This is our medical officer, Dr. Kavrilov. One of our crewmen has been badly burned and needs immediate medical attention. I know you understand us. You communicated with our scientists and gave us the coordinates to reach you. I am Fagor, ruler of Vartvern. There is no time left. We must leave our planet. It is doomed. All that is left are what you see now. There can't be more than 30 of you left alive. If we had not sought shelter beneath the surface, we would have burned up in the firestorm. Where is your ship? You cannot have come so great a distance in that so small a craft. That's our shuttlecraft. We will contact our ship to rescue you. But first, we must save Gonzalez. You must save us now! First we'll take Gonzalez up and then come back for you. He needs immediate medical attention or he'll die. No! Your man is no, no consequence. Order your ship to pick us up now. Figure emits a bolt of energy, energy that consumes Gonzalez's body in flames. Sharp and careful of staring sharp. Shot and disbelief. Alan reaches for his weapon, only to have it burst into flame as Fagor emits another bolt of energy. Oh, oh, Captain, this is Quan on board the shuttle. It's horrible. The Terran, he burned Gonzalez up alive. Quan, what happened? The Terrans have eye plates that glow, and, and they seem to possess... Captain, they're coming toward us. They're approaching the shuttle. Steady, Quan. One wrong action will jeopardize all your lives. Stay calm. See what they want. Communication signal the ship's crew. Security section on red alert. Captain, they're right outside the shuttle. What is their form? Humanoid, sir. Ten feet tall. The shuttle door slides open. Alan sticks his head in. Easy, Quan. I have the leader of the Contarans with me. He wants to speak to the captain. Are you in contact now? Y yes, sir. Figure is seated in front of the view screen. Alan glances quickly around looking for a weapon. You are the leader? Well, Al, you're communicating te telepathically. I am Captain McAndrew. We are responding to your distress signal. Your planet is plunging toward your sun. In a few hours, your planet's entire atmosphere will explode in fire. We are aware, Captain. We must leave this planet. You must pick us up the remaining contrarians. Now! Hold on. Why did you kill our crewman, Gonzalez? He was of no, no further value. We eliminate all who are not useful to our society. Vagar, in our society we value human life. We have learned through our own global wars the futility of unnecessary death and destruction. Time goes short. Land your ship and take us off this doomed planet. I will give you my decision shortly. Kness Redding, Henley, and Bantu, stand by. On the command bridge, the captain is deep in thought. Suddenly he turns and faces the bridge crew. We were sent on a rescue mission. There are 30, 30 Crontarans left alive on the planet. Yet Fagor's low regard for life gives me grave doubt. Captain, if we allow the Contarans on board, they could take over the ship. 
or kill us, or strand us here to die in the fire. Those are my thoughts exactly. Sir, we must rescue Officer Sharp and the others. Uh, I suggest we land this ship as close to the hole as possible, so we'll learn what the Contarians are up to. Ready? That's it. It's our only chance. I'm putting you in charge. Cadet Chicada, I want max force speed, break orbit, and descend to the landing coordinates. Aye, sir. Engine room, give us max force speed at the countdown. Three, two, one, zero. The star pilot lunges toward the burning planet. The blazing sun fast approaches, burning the planet's surface. Attention security, have weapons ready. We're going to pick up the Krantarans. If they enter peacefully, confine them to the message crew on level C. If they attempt to take over, shoot on sight. Security officer Kimchak, select three volunteers and report to the bridge in T-10 with blaster rifles and stun guns. All right, silence. Let's stay alert. You heard the captain. We've got some tough customers coming aboard. Now, I need three volunteers. I will go. Carrie, I don't think you're quite ready for this session. I will go. Uh, yeah, oh, okay, all right. I need two more. Kendrick and Warden, follow me and bring your weapons. The rest of you, station yourselves on sea deck near the mess hall. Kiri reaches into his locker. I will bring my cherished tribal spear with the jagged point on the end. <coughs> Navigation, set a course for the shuttle's coordinates and put me through to Quan Lee on the video screen scanner. Quan Lee appears on the screen looking tense. Quan, tell Figo we are coming down. First we pick up our crewmen, then the Quarantarians will be allowed on board. I have heard, Captain. Will you wait your arrival? Kimchik enters the bridge with the security volunteers. Kimchik, Gonzalez has been killed by the Krantarians. Alan, Kavrilov, Juan, and Ariku are being held prisoner. Sir, give me and my men a chance. We will make them pay for this. Hold it, Kimchik. Cadet Redding has a plan. Hear him out. Our crew are safely on board, and then we'll allow the Krantarians to board. What if they try to force their way on? Then, and only then, we'll stop them. Then we call for reinforcements and try to rescue our men. Any questions? Just one, Matt. By stopping them, do you mean we should shoot to kill? That's right. The captain thinks that if I try to take over the ship. But, but I never thought I'd have to kill. Let them try to do this, and we will stop them. I swear this on the blood of my ancestors. If any of them try anything, I'll blast them all the way back to Jupiter. The captain put me in charge of this mission. No one fires his weapon unless I do. We don't want to provoke them. Well, I don't trust them. You heard what they did to Gonzalez. Incinerated him. I'll get even for that. Take it easy, Kimchek. The plan is to get off this doomed planet before we all burn up. The Fronterans know this. They'd be crazy to start trouble at this point. The march is, the march is only a few hours. Be on guard. The scene shifts to the okay. shuttle craft on the ground. Quan Lee is thinking. By the gods, where is our Riku? I haven't seen it since Fago approached the shuttle. Where is that little Martian hiding? Who is a Riku? Is he in this craft? Who is a Riku? Fagor tries to probe his brain. Wanley winces in pain. Oh, oh, it's no oh, use to lie. As you see, I can read your mind. Suddenly another Krontaren leans into the shuttle and points at the red sky. Look, Fagor, the star pilot is descending toward us with the engines blazing. Fagor leaves the shuttle with the second Krontaran, and they walk over to a large boulder. Alan and Kavrilov sit on the ground, looking up at two Krontaran, whose eye plates are glowing. Alan sees Fagor and tries to get up, but Kavrilov restrains him. 
The two Krantherans walk back to the shuttle where Quan Lee is trying to contact the ship. Star pilot, this is Quan on the shuttle. Can you hear me? Observing electrical interference. Can you correct? Can you? The shuttle door opens. Quan slowly turns in his seat and stares into the glowing eye plate of Fagor. Your ship is about to land, so there is no further need to communicate with them. We will go outside and await their arrival. Quan moves to the shuttle door. Quan is now staring at another Grantaran with a glowing eye plate. You, walk in front of Sintar. Do not try to escape. You will soon join your comrades who are exploring the area. Quan and the Grantaran on approach the large boulder where Ellen and Karvalov are seated on the ground. I was told you two were exploring the area. We got as far as this rock and met our two new friends here, and they took away our guns. Those glowing eye plates mean we're one step away from being incinerated. If we can just find out what they're up to. My guess is they plan on taking over the star pilot. They'll probably wait until the ship lands and attack when the ramp doors open. Or else wait until everyone's on board. I don't think they'll wait. They must realize we can alert the ship when we board. We've got to warn them somehow. It's no use. We won't get more than a few steps before these two incinerate us alive. Vigor signals his followers to re-enter the hull. Meanwhile, on the ship, the captain has turned to Cadet Shikata. Shikata, approximate distance to the firestorm. About 10 kilometers, Captain. Attention crew, we are now on red alert. <laughs> Do not, I repeat, do not blow up the boarding ramp until you hear my order. Security squad Beta and Delta, take up positions in the corridor adjacent to the loading ramp. Captain, there's something coming in on the shuttle frequency. Arico, it's you. Where have you been? We thought you were a goner. Stand by, Cadet Shikata. Arico, what is your location? I'm hiding in the shuttle, Captain. When I saw the Karen murder Gonzalez and come toward the shuttle, I hid in the storage locker where I could see and hear everything. I need a full report from the field. Captain, you must prepare the ship for possible attack. The Karens have taken Officer Sharp, Dr. Kavrilov, and Quan Lee as prisoners to are guarding them. What is their location? They walked behind a large rock, but they never returned. Where is Fagor? He and the others disappeared into that hole. Stay away from the hole. It's a source of intense heat and electrical energy. That might be the energy source for the recharging of their eye plates. Could be why they all went down there. You are correct about the Quarantarian's plans. They've gone into the hole to recharge. Cadet Redding, your rescue plan is operational. If you exit the ship through the rear hatchway, you'll have the element of surprise on your side. Right, Captain. We're ready to move out. Captain, we need time to start our engines and prepare the liftoff before the firestorm arrives. You've got one hour, Redding. Remember, one hour. I understand, Captain. We'll make it. Come on, Redding. What are you waiting for? Let's get them. We'll work our way along the gully with our weapons and be ready to fire. Let's go. Head for the shuttle and ask a Riku where the others are being held prisoner. The rescue party walks beneath the large boulder. Suddenly, a figure pops up. They flatten themselves against the rock. Kimchik whirls around and aims his rifle at the figure. Wait! Hold your fire! It is I, Ariku! Ariku, what are you doing out there? I saw you on the shuttle scanner. You are going the wrong way. The others were taken behind those rocks. If we are careful, we can take the two Kronterans by 
surprise. Uh oh, that firestorm is moving toward us even faster. Come on, Ned, let's head for the drive. Where we go will lead you. I'll go with the others. Kiri and I will circle around and come up from behind. Come on, Matt, let's go. Commun the communicator on Matt's belt emits a beep. This is Redding. Redding, it's the captain. What's your progress? We're almost there, Captain. We're approaching from two sides. Hurry. Navigation revised the ETA of the Firestorm. You have only 23 minutes to accomplish the mission. Instruct the group to come aboard using the main cargo ramp. We'll lower it when we, when we see you coming. Cadet Redding, Matt, good luck. Suddenly there is a piercing, agonizing scream. <laughs> group runs toward the sound. They see Alan, Kamralov, and Kwan Lee crouching in fear next to the boulder, looking in the direction of the screen. Ready! Boy, are we glad to see you. What was that scream? It was horrible. One of Kimchak's men was spotted by the Kronteran, and they burned into death with their eye plates. Oh, my God! Oh, my God. Oh, my God. More shouts are heard. All six men run toward the shouts. Kimchak fires his rifle blindly at the Kronteran. This is for the laws. Take that, that, and that. The bursts strike ground and rocks, but none hit. The Kronteran's eye plate glows bright red, emits a shaft of flame that hits Kimchak. Momentum takes him a few steps and he crumples to the ground in a burning heap and emits a long, agonizing scream. <laughs> Rex runs from behind a large rock. The crowd here and hears him and whirls around, his eye plate glowing a bright red. Rex fires his stun gun with little effect. A look of terror on his face. Suddenly the Kronteran falls forward and to the ground. Look, the Kiri's battle spear sticking out of his back. You see, I told you I was ready for this mission. They stand near the columns of smoke that rise from the charged bodies of the Kronteran and Earthmen. Kimchek, is he dead? Yes. We better take Kimchik's rifle with us. What the devil is that? More trouble. Let's get back to the ship fast. Where is Ariku? Good heavens, he was with Kimchik. We can't wait another second. Let's hope he's headed back to the ship. Which way is back to the ship? <laughs> that direction. The fire, it's almost here. The entire countryside is engulfed in flames. Come on, we have to cut across the open area. Near that hole. It's our only chance to make it back to the ship in time. The group runs toward the ship with Alan in the lead. Suddenly he stops and looks up. His mouth drops open and he stares transfixed. Look, the Kronteran are floating out of the hole in twos and threes toward the star pilot. But six are veering towards us. Now we blaze with the blast through rifles. The group is galvanized in action. <laughs> the lead Kronteran is hit and plummets to the ground, followed by the two behind him. The remaining three float out of the blaster range. They hover, plotting their next move. Now is our chance. Let us head for the ship. Wait! We can't! There's 20 Kronteran between us and the star pilot. We'll never make it. The shuttle. It's our only chance. Head for it. Oh no! The shuttle! It's taking off! The shuttle slowly lifts off the ground about three feet and hovers. The shuttle! The shuttle door is opening. Look! Ariku is inside, waving us in. <laughs> Ariku, he made it. He was heading for the shuttle all along. They all climb aboard and settle back with a sigh of relief. 
the shuttle vibrates, its engines trying to gain altitude. Matt has taken over the controls. Suddenly the cabin is partially obscured in shadow. It's him! It's Vigor! Ah! He's in my head. He wants me to pick him up or he will incinerate us all. Ah! Within a rage cry, Matt pushes forward on the controls and sends the shuttle racing forward with a burst of speed. Vigor is knocked off the shuttle and falls toward the burning planet below. Look, out the window. It's the star pilot. Arrico, quick, get the captain on video scanner. We have to warn him of the approaching from Terrence. Ready, what is the status of your mission? Captain, we're on our way to the ship. The Krantarans, they've killed Kimtech and two of his men. They tried to kill us all. Yeah, A group of Krantarans are approaching the ship now. They plan to take the ship by force. Don't worry. We are aware. We have a surprise for them when they come aboard the ship. See you soon. As the presider of the United States Council, Captain, it is my honor to present you and your star pilot crew members and the United Planetary Science Space Academy cadets with citations and valor under the direst of circumstances. Mission accomplished and accomplished <coughs> and welcome back. Thank you for listening to Grand Terran by yours truly, Jordan Lawson. Let's have a round of applause for the cast. wonderful job. Once again, this script was written by Jordan Lawson, so let's give him a giant round of applause. Our sound effects people over there, we've got Mary and Lynn on sound effects, and Anita doing their music, let's give them a big round of applause. We also, uh, all of the intros were written by Ruth Ann, so uh, she did a wonderful job. And one quick uh, other mention, one of our students broke his arm last week and couldn't perform today. That's Gordy. He's back there watching. So we had understudies go on at the last second just today. We featured several people into other roles. Brian played a role he wasn't uh, had never really gotten to rehearse. Uh, Chuck was thrown on in a role that he never got to rehearse. Birgit and, and uh, Ruth Cadison were playing roles that they were just handed today. So a lot of people were thrown in at the last second. And I think they all did a wonderful job. Let's give them all a wonderful night. We just love that you're here to support us, so thank you all so much. And uh, in a moment, we're going to open up our buffet, but Brian's staring at me. Yes. So take it away, Brian. How about a round of applause for oh, our stop it. Yeah. And uh, oh, you guys. Thank you, Chuck. This is from the entire crew here. I was going to say Motley crew, but they're really not Motley. <laughs> they're, they're extremely well-dressed. They're a great, well great bunch of people. Yeah. And thank you for putting up with us. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I'm thrilled to get to work with this non-Motley crew. So uh, please uh, meet your friends up here. Join the class in, in the summer or the fall and enjoy some snacks on us. Thank you again. Love you all for coming. Thank you. Thank